Welcome to Ranger Public Library. And we are thrilled to welcome Desmond Cole, the winning author of Ranger Reads 2021, the author of the book, um, The Skin We Are In. And this program, we would like to start with land acknowledgement. As part of our commitment to reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, learn and play on the traditional and current lands of Treaty 6 First Nations and Treaty 7 First Nations, as well as um, Métis people of Region 3. We respect the histories, languages and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. So in our final event, uh, we also have Diluta Datus, our The Skin We Are In region champion, who will be joining Desmond Cole in um, conversation after Desmond will um, do a reading from his book and, and, and talk about his book. So Desmond, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this. Um, good evening to everybody. Good evening to you, Diolita. It's so nice to be with you. Um, I want to thank Red Deer Public Libraries for sponsoring Red Deer Reads 2021. It's really unfortunate with everything we're continuing to be living through right now uh, that I can't be there in person, but I guess this is the next best thing. I know it's a really difficult time for a lot of people right now, so I just wanted to thank everybody um, for being with us this evening. And I want to um, especially thank Tatiana Tilly for all of your work in coordinating this with the library to make it um, possible. Uh, I thought I would just read a very, very short excerpt from the book to begin this evening, our conversation. And um, this is from the July chapter of my book. Um, the book is broken down in months by the year uh, for the year 2017. And I'm writing about different things that are happening in black life and black struggles during this year in Canada. And in July of 2017, of course, we were in the midst of a celebration of Canada's 150th birthday. And um, there was a lot of incredible indigenous organizing and resistance and teaching going on across Canada during that time. And so uh, this is one of the things that I'm thinking about in that book. And I was in uh, Alberta in 2017 in July. And I went to Edmonton, um, Calgary, and Lethbridge to talk about the practice of police carding, the practice of police stopping people and demanding that they identify themselves um, and uh, how that practice has been harming Black and Indigenous people. So I want to just read a really brief excerpt about that in the book and then begin our conversation this evening. In July of 2017, I took a tour of three cities in Alberta, Lethbridge, Calgary, and Edmonton, to engage residents in conversations about the, their experiences with police carding. Activists in the province had pushed local police forces to publish data about carding and race. As expected, the data showed that Black and Indigenous people were far more likely than others to be carded. Their, the profiling of Indigenous people, especially women, was particularly high in Alberta. In Edmonton, for example, police carded Indigenous women at 10 times the rate of white women. Local police insisted the disproportions had nothing to do with race. Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people in Edmonton and beyond continue to go missing and, and to be, uh, to, to continue to go missing, excuse me, continue to be abused and murdered. At a community meeting in Edmonton, a woman shared her experience of vulnerability. Quote, I grew up in a neighborhood with sex workers on the street, many of whom were Indigenous women. I would crawl through glass today to thank those women because I would have never made it to school on multiple occasions if it weren't for women chasing away those creeps. And some of those women were obviously hurt, 
were taken, were murdered. I know this because they would disappear. End of quote. I wrote in this book also following that passage about the report into murdered and missing indigenous women and girls um, at, that came out shortly after uh, this time that I'm talking about in the book. And you know, with so many things in Canada, people in our country, this white majority country said, you know, we're ready to have this conversation. We need to have this conversation. And then of course the report came out and it talked about genocide. And suddenly white Canada didn't wanna have the conversation about missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two spirit people anymore because that word genocide connected to this country was too close to home. And I think that that's where we're stuck in this country right now in Canada. We're stuck at a time where many people will say that they are ready to listen, that they are ready to have important conversations, that they're ready for change, but they also want to dictate to indigenous people, to black people, how far we are allowed to go in the conversation. And the July chapter of this book is about First Nations, Métis and Inuit struggles across Canada because I see those as being linked to the struggles that Black people are experiencing as well. And so um, I think we're still in that time period. I think we're still in a time of performativity. We're at a time where politicians and corporations and big institutions and, and, and the like are learning how to say the right words, how to express the language of anti-racism and anti-oppression but no further than that. And so the murder of George Floyd last year caused international uh, you know, disruption and um, made visible the black struggle in another new way that we've been seeing all across the last many years. Uh, but just because people responded by making a corporate statement or by saying that they wanted to do some diversity training how that actually changes life for the average black person in Canada is the question that we should be always focused on. It's really good to have a few more people in government, in institutions, on television. Those aren't necessarily bad things, but that's not our quest. It's like, what is life like for the average black person in Canada? Can they eat? Do they have a job? Are they safe? Are they being surveilled by the police in their community? Can their children get successfully through school without racism and harassment? These are the only questions that we really, I think, need to be answering. And there are a lot of distractions out there to take us away from those questions. But um, that is where I always hope to focus. And that's what I tried to do with this book. And I'm so, so grateful. I know many people who are watching this right now will know that I was born in Red Deer, Alberta. And so it's a pretty special honor for Red Deer Reads to acknowledge this bit, this book and to give me this opportunity this evening. And uh, Diolita, I have to say good evening and welcome and thank you to you because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here because you were the champion of this book for Red Deer Reads 2021. And you made the case and advocated for my work to be recognized and I just want to say thank you again from the bottom of my heart for your contribution and for the work that you're also doing in Red Deer. I don't know how to take that thank you because without this book, if you didn't write this, if you, if you didn't put our stories and our experiences in this book, I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to even do that. Because we, we have these stories, we know, we know we've lived these experiences, but I think I'm, I'll forever be grateful that you actually chose to do this. Like you, you chose to do the hard work um, because this will be here for generations to come. And I, I hope that you realize how big of a deal this is. Like, I think, I don't know if, like, do you realize this? Like how, how big of a deal this is? Is this a big deal to you? Uh the whole success of this book, the fact that we're a year and a half out from this book, more of like, 
you know, we're getting closer to two years now in February, in late January of this book being published. This year is almost over. And, and, and so the fact that people are still talking about it um, is beyond anything that I could have been hoping for. It makes me, I don't know, it, it, it is a little bit, it is a little bit surreal. It's a little bit um, overwhelming sometimes at times, I guess, to think about. Okay. But I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful. And, um, you know, this book builds on the work of a lot of people in Canada who have been doing this for generations. And I think like the best part of being able to do it was to be able to have time to sit and read and think about and share their work yeah. as well. Um, and, and so like none of what I put in the book is brand new. It's all just a continuing story of what other people who came to this country before us have been building. And, you know, it's been now um, more than more than uh, more than 40 years since my parents came to Red Deer, Alberta from Sierra Leone. And certainly a lot of things have changed during that time. But if it wasn't for my parents and my grandparents um, making the sacrifices that they did, I wouldn't have been able to share this story. And in the same way, like people fighting in their local school boards in education, I'm sure many of your viewers are um, familiar with the story of Yuna Momolu, the mom in Edmonton who was fighting for her 11 year old son after he got kicked out of school for wearing a do-rag. But black people have been organizing like that in Edmonton schools and in Alberta schools for generations, like literally. and it takes time and energy to go through the histories to meet people who were there and who fought for those things 30 and 40 years ago some of them are not even with us anymore right and so it's i feel like this work is really building it's building on things that have happened before and trying to continue um sharing our stories sharing our struggle building upon the struggle that came before okay so as you were writing this book, who, who did you write this book for? Like when you wrote this book, was, was there specific groups of people or people or even demographic, dare I say, that you really want to read this book? Because every time I'm, I'm facilitating sessions, I just want to do an Oprah giveaway and be like, you get this book and you get this book because I do believe that everyone needs to read it. But as an author and as a storyteller, who did you write this book for? Who did you, who do you want to read this book? I, I wrote this book for, um, Black people primarily in Canada, because that's whose activism and scholarship I'm really sharing in the book. And so a commentary that I get a lot of the time is that people will say, oh, you know, I heard one of these stories or one or two of these stories before you put them into this book. I can remember the news talking about them but it was the overall impression of seeing them all collected together in this way that was really um that was effective i guess in the presentation and um i wanted to honor those people's struggles and not allow for them to be forgotten or erased because many of them were things that like when I read the news i would read them and then time goes on and you wonder like what happened to people who were engaged in these struggles it might not be on the front page anymore it might not be as visible as it was before but what are those folks up to and um people are always doing things behind the scenes right that we don't see so first and foremost this book was to honor some of that struggle that people are doing in canada every day as black folks as indigenous folks as other people of color but specifically black people our struggle i put that first and I was like, that's who's going to understand this book without any other need for prompting or history. Like we're living the history. Yeah. We'll, we'll almost, it. it was almost like reading a diary 
um, for most for most people, um, especially Black people, because like you said, these stories are different stories. We know them, and we or we know someone who knew them right through the community. And so to to be able to have this is is almost validation of some sort. It was almost as a diary that you wrote on behalf um, of the community, and which brings me to my next question, where with with what has happened, especially summer of 2020, well, not even summer, because I believe it was in February where Amar Aubrey um, was killed. So the entire 2020 and even prior to that, um, what has changed? What do you, what do you feel has changed? Or do you feel as if this, um, the recordings, the social media, the protests validated what was in your book? Or do you feel as if your book may have been so, uh, some form of prophetic word before to say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. This is an issue. Take note. And then everything happened for people to see. How how do you feel about that? Or have you even thought about that? I, I think about that all the time. And I think uh, what has changed, if anything, is some of the language that we're using. Mm -hmm. So we see that institutions like our governments and our big companies are trying to use language that they believe relates to some issues related to anti-racism and anti-blackness specifically. Um, I think that they felt before that they didn't need to address those issues, that it wasn't actually core to their mission or to operating a government every day, to operating a business every day. That's not our focus. We sell shoes, we sell music, we, run a government so learning about anti-black racism and how it's operating in this country we can live without it george floyd changed that but i think in a way that we need to really think about because george floyd was shocking yeah. that murder that lynching that was shared around the world that was a shock to people's system it shouldn't have been I remember seeing Eric Garner being choked out by Daniel Pantaleo in New York City on the street several years ago. I remember going to Ferguson after Mike Brown was murdered. None of these things should be shocking to anybody. But while we changed some of our language and there were all of these solidarity statements and people making commitments, oh, I want to do something about racism. What we didn't see changing, Dulita, I think, was like the direct incident that we were all talking about, which was a police officer being able to murder someone with impunity. Um, that is still as possible today as it was when that happened last year. And while we have said George Floyd's name a thousand times in this country, we do not say the names of people like Anthony Ost, Abdurrahman Abdi, Andrew Loku, Chantel Moore, Rodney Levi, you know, DeAndre Campbell shot in his home last year by the police after calling 911 for help, a 26-year-old Black man living with schizophrenia. How come, if we were so concerned suddenly with police violence, we were not talking about the people who are being harmed in this country? And that's just those who had their lives taken that we know about. The majority of people in this country who are harmed by the police every day are not killed by the police. That's, that's overboard. The violence that we are experiencing has to do with surveillance. It has to do with unnecessary stops, tickets, beatings, arrests, separation from our children through the child welfare system is one of the biggest emerging issues in Canada with the police. You don't have to die. And I think that is where all the shock value of the lynching of George Floyd ends, is when you can't be shocked anymore because this is a routine thing that is happening in your communities that doesn't just kill people, but like affects every part of their lives, that's actually a lot harder to respond to and to contend with. And I think that's the mission that we're on is to make some lasting kind of changes rather than getting shocked about something and trying really frantically to do something to like make ourselves feel better about the awful thing that we have just been exposed to. And when I say we in that case, I mean mainstream Canada. Black people are never surprised by these things, even if we are shocked. We can't afford to be surprised. Indigenous peoples are not surprised by these things. We can't afford it. So 
I think that that's the rest of the country that is always kind of in this cycle of shock and then withdrawal. And then you get shocked again because residential school graves are being unearthed and then you go into withdrawal and then you're shocked because the prime minister didn't go to the ceremony about this and then we withdraw again. So we need to break out of that cycle. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, one of the chapters that I read that I thought was really fascinating was around Black activism and Black unity and Black organization. And um, you mentioned that um, there was a speaker at one of the gatherings that you attended where all of the dignitaries and all of the people that use performative language um, spoke. So you had the prime minister spoke and then you had the mayor spoke and you had all of these other people that we know do not necessarily pass the black test as, as it was said, right? Like we, we know this, don't pass the black test, um, but they're forever present. And like you said, forever making statements of solidarity and commitments and, you know, all of this. So um, how, <laughs> I, I, how do you, how do we get them to pass the Black test almost? Like how, what do you think it will take in organizing and from organizers to say, hey, this is the bar because as we've seen within the past year, they've given us everything except for what we've asked for. So yes. we've gotten holidays, um, we've gotten honorable mentions, we've gotten TV shows, we've gotten rebranding of um, items that we didn't necessarily ask for. We've got books planned that we didn't ask for, except for the things that we did ask for, which is reform, um, abolishment of, of certain entities. We've asked for concrete um, support. We've asked for financial support. We've asked for like all of these things for reform, 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 and change and abolish, um, you know, and none of that has come. But we did get, you know, Uncle Ben remove and Aunt Jemima remove. So <laughs> how do we get these people to pass the Black test? I'm, this is such a wonderful question. Thank you. And uh, for those who have not read the book, the Black Test is something put forward by Ronaldo Walcott, who's um, a professor of women and gender studies here in Toronto and a brilliant thinker and writer in this country for Black life and Black struggle. And Ronaldo's Black Test is simply this. If a government policy does not ameliorate, it does not improve, right, the lives of the most underserved and oppressed and ignored Black people, throw it out. It's not worth it. Programs that simply seem to give a couple of people an opportunity in an institution, that, is, that does not pass the Black test. Even electing people to office as individuals does not pass the Black test. The Black test is about policy. So when we say we're going to pass policies that are going to help Black people, do they help Black people who are uh, on social assistance or on disability? Do they help Black people who are living with disabilities every day? Do they help Black people who don't have housing? Do the policies help Black people who have been kicked out of school or out of institutions or who are in jail or who are in immigration detention? That's what Ronaldo Walcott means when he talks about the Black test. And I think that from what I have seen, Julita, the way that things actually get implemented is through organized ongoing resistance that unites with like-minded groups of people around us. I'll give you a couple of examples of things that are in the book. I have a whole chapter in the book about police officers being in our schools. This is a modern phenomenon. We did not used to do this in the way that we do now in Canada. And we used to say, oh, that's an American thing. You know, they have metal detectors in the school. Everybody's paranoid about guns all the time. That's an American thing. But very normally as more black people particularly came to our cities, suddenly that there was this need now to have armed police officers in so many of our schools. Well, those battles are happening at the local level because the government of Canada doesn't implement cops in schools, local school boards and local city councils do that and local police forces. And so the battle to get them out of our schools has been happening literally one city at a time and in um, Vancouver and in Hamilton, Ontario 
in Mississauga and Brampton and Halton regions in Ontario, in Toronto here, uh, in a lot of places around the country, one by one, these programs are being challenged and they're being shut down. And um, there are so many things that are affecting our lives that I think that the only way for it to work is for people to organize where they spend their time. Mm -hmm. I heard that Amazon is trying to unionize a, 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 an outlet in Alberta right now. And obviously we know no Amazon in North America has ever unionized yet. Amazon workers are dealing with some of the most unlivable and inhumane working conditions in terms of like factory work. Um, but the company, which is a multi-billion, one of the richest companies in the world now, doesn't want people who make them all that money to have a decent standard of living. So now there's going to be a big battle in Alberta for this Amazon factory warehouse to see if they're going to be able to be the first ones um, to unionize. That's the logical place for people in that place to organize because that's where they work. That's where they spend the most of their time and energy. And so they can advance the struggle for better wages, for better working conditions, for better legal protections for workers, all of which are central issues to Black people. They can advance that at work. If somebody is a student and they have to spend most of their time going to school, I feel like that's the place where we see students fighting and we've seen students on our campuses fighting for everything from like, their, their students going to school accessing food banks every day. Yeah. Like this is where we are in Canada. And what will a school do? A school will say, ah, we're going to create a new diversity position and put one black person there. But there's a hundred black people who came to school that day and didn't have food. So we have to actually be organizing in the places where we spend most of our time and linking up with other struggles Every time we might think that something that we're going through is only happening to us, we have to remember that it isn't and that there are other people who are experiencing it too. And that the way that we build different communities is by our relationships with other people who are going through the same stuff that we're going through. Building relationships and learning how to work together to fight for what we want. That's literally the whole game for me. That's how we change things because we are isolated at this time. We are isolated from even the people that we work around and even the people that we shop in the store with, we're isolated. And the only way that we're going to do better organizing is through building more relationships with one another and learning to trust and build with one another. Okay, so in trusting and building, and you brought up Amazon, and, and I thought it was interesting because Amazon, um, if you look at it, usually employs a lot of immigrants, um, a lot of newcomers, um, a lot of people of um, lower income, right? Um, which brings me to the question of immigration, yeah. which I identify as a forever immigrant. I was born in IET, I was raised in the Bahamas, and now I'm on Treaty 6. And even when you become permanent resident or a Canadian, you're, you, there's still that Haitian-born um, Canadian, right? Or they say Desmond Cole, born in Red Deer, but whose parents are from Sierra Leone. Like there's always that attachment. Um, and what I noticed uh, throughout the book, something that stood out to me was the, the recurring theme of movement. People leaving home um, or forced to leave home thinking Canada is going to be a better space, a better place. And they come here and they lose their lives. So they lose body parts. Or like many Haitian immigrants, they've been turned away at the border. Yes. And this is um, the place that, you know, the friendliest country, one of the friendliest countries on earth, and we're multicultural and all of that. So when it comes to movement, migration, immigration, and identity, how does it all fit? Because for a lot of people, they'll say, well, I understand police brutality, but if undocumented people are coming across the border, then that's where I draw the line. What is the connection between the two um, and how... How do you think that people actually get it? Um, I think that honestly, in some very lived experience kind of way, all people get this from their own perspective, but they might not outwardly think about it the same way. And what I mean by that is that um, immigration, we can call it immigration, but I think the bigger 
thing that we need to think about is like, whose land are we on? So you just talked about being in Treaty 6 this evening. I'm on the land of the Mississaugas of the Credit in Toronto, where Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and Wendat people live for millennia before so-called immigration. But the first immigration wasn't immigration. It was imperialism. It was conquest. It was, we want to come and seize these lands on the name of God and in the name of the monarch. And we want to take all of the wealth that is in these lands and send it back to Europe. And we want to colonize and farm and have a better way of living as white invaders. That's how this country started. And it's those people who decided the rules for immigration for everybody else. They didn't follow their own. Yeah. Uh, we didn't follow the pattern that they did. And many of us, like, so you talk about Haiti, which was, of course, colonized by the French. And we know that story. Well, we don't, we don't know it well enough. We don't talk about it enough in Canada, yeah. particularly in the role that we have played in Haiti's history. But um, my parents came from another British colony. So there was no place to escape the, the rule of Britain, France, Spain, Italy. They were fighting to try and conquer the world over and to oppress people and take their lands and take their resources. There's no way to talk about immigration unless we're starting from there. Because when people say, well, I draw the line at people crossing the border, the border is not real. The border is imposed by people who stole this country. The border is not real. The US-Mexico border is not real. The Canada-US border is not real. And the only reason that people can have something here that they think that they're allowed to defend is at the barrel of a gun by this colonial government. Haitian people who have been trying to come across the border over the last several years and other refugee claimants have as much entitlement to come beyond these lands and to leave places where they feel unsafe, where not they feel unsafe, where they are unsafe, yeah. where life has been made impossible by capitalism, imperialism, by the theft of land and resources ongoing, by us empowering corporate rule, and, um, you know, rule by IMF and rule by like powerful nations who get to control the debt in these countries and all these things. That's why people continue to migrate, continue to be forced to flee places where they are. And then they come to the Canada-US border and they have to sneak through the snow in the middle of the night because if they go to the checkpoint as they're told to do, they'll be told, ah, sorry, you can't come into this country. This country that has all this conquered territory and no one living on it relative to a lot of other places in the world. All of these natural resources. Who do those resources belong to? Did they, long, did they belong to anybody? Right? And so I think that the problem with defending a border with guns and defending territory with weapons and with soldiers and with CBSA agents the way that we do is that this isn't our land. Hmm. We were supposed to be visitors here and to honor treaties that we made with different nations and to have relationships as, as, as different people's nation to nation. And we are violating all of our treaty agreements, not all, every single one of them, but the majority of them are being completely trampled to this day. So I know Canadian white folks in many cases don't want to go back. They, they think like, well, that's history and that's who won and you just got to get over it. I'm not going to um, because the lands that were taken from us, the resources that were taken from us, the lives that were taken across the Atlantic passage when millions of us were sent here to work and many of us died along the way, that's not something to get over. It's something to remedy. It's something to acknowledge and to make amends for. And the way to do that isn't interpersonally, it's by sharing a new, I think, un understanding of this land and its resources for everybody. And the issues that we're facing right now around climate change are going to affect every single person in the world. And the most interesting thing is Africa, the continent of Africa is responsible for the least amount of carbon emission of any continent, and yet is going to feel the effects of rising coastal um, um, waters and of extreme heat more than a lot of other places around the world. So it's a nice idea to sit here in Canada and say, we'll control who comes in and who comes out. 
our impact across the world is being felt by people who we have never met and who we're not maybe thinking about as much as we should be. So I'm not interested in borders. Borders are, I invite everybody to read Harsha Walia's book about borders and colonization. Um, we need to really think differently about whose land this is and why people have the right to defend it with guns. Okay, so a lot of, before writing this book, you are a columnist, and a lot of the drama started with media, right? Like at the Toronto Star, I believe it was. That's right. Uh, yeah. So what role does the media play in all of this? Because I, one of the um, other themes, recurring themes that I noticed was um, you push the media as well. So you would push the media as, um, as you pushed local police officers, as you pushed um, law, enfor law enforcement, sorry, as well as the legislators, so, so rep representatives. Um, but the media for the most part has um, sort of done the Caesar thing where, you know, we've washed our hands. It's not us, we're just here to report. That's right. But the way that they're reporting, the way that the narratives, the way they cover stories, the way um, they narrate a lot of these stories as well, um, and the way that they play both sides of the story, right? Well, we have to cover both sides of the story. Where do you see, what role did they, do they play and continue to play in this? Um, and how, what changes would you like to see on an, in an ideal world? Well, the media's role is like, it's hard to even capture it. It's so big, right? Yeah. Like media is how many of us get the, biggest pieces of information about what's going on around us in the world. And that is because media is designed in a very corporate consumer fashion to be easy for us to consume. So you can go on Facebook where we're having this conversation right now and you can get um, news, but then you can also get all this advertising to buy yourself some clothes or to buy yourself the latest gadgets and whatever. And it's like, you're on the go, you don't have time. So we'll give you the news and like snap, 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 right? But then like, what's the quality of that news and information? How is it actually being presented to you? Whose perspective is the news coming from? Who gets to tell the story? And I don't mean who's the broadcaster, who's the um, reporter, who's the news anchor, who's the producer. I don't mean like that. I mean like we see stories in Canada all the time, for example, um, I'll take the statue of Edward Cornwallis in Halifax, which I wrote about in my book, that people wanted it removed because Edward Cornwallis, um, you know, ordered that Mi'kmaq people be scalped in his creation of the city of Halifax. This was genocide. And um, now there's a statue that, you know, was in the public square that people are like, we don't want this here. And I can't tell you how many stories I saw about that statue and about other statues of colonial figures which never included a single person from the local First Nations, Métis, or Inuit communities that were at play. So how do you do media stories about the impact of this kind of history and these celebrations of white supremacy and not talk to the first peoples of these lands? How is that even possible? Um, why do we do stories about the police beating up people and the police are the only people cited in the story, right? If I heard that Tom beat his neighbor up, what kind of journalism would it be to go to Tom and ask him how that went and not to talk to anybody else, right? This is the kind of media that is being presented to us and it's all like 30 and 60 second sound bites. So, you know, also cut to commercial and buy some things for yourself and be distracted, quite frankly, from what's really going on around you. Uh, I believe in independent media. I do not ever think that the corporate media in this country is going to change its ways. Corporate media in this country is married to the game. They've got a ring on their finger and they need neocolonialism, capitalism, and power imbalances and class imbalances in order to keep doing what they want to do. And my experience at the Toronto Star just demonstrates that once people who get into these 
institutions try to push too much, they're shoved out the door. And this didn't just happen to me, it happened to my friend and colleague Ali, Az Aziza Kanji, who was writing about a lot of uh, issues related to the Muslim community and to Palestine. And she too was just forced out in a really hostile work environment at a newspaper that's supposed to be like, oh, the city's most diverse country, like the most diverse roster of voices and thoughts and opinions, except that you, gotta, you better stay in this box of opinions. And if you go outside of it, we're gonna come and get you. We're gonna come collect you, right? So um, I don't have hope for those institutions to change. And I've done enough work in the last 11 years to try and start new conversations in the Canadian media landscape. It's pretty hopeless. Um, but like when you make money selling those people, like I said, the shoes and the gadgets and the whatever, when that's the reason, news, news doesn't exist to inform us, right? It, it exists to make money for the people who are at the top of it. So that's not the kind of news that's going to get us free. And um, some of the best news that we have in Canada comes from small independent sources. How do those sources fund their, in, in their organization and stay alive is the new kind of question and challenge that we need to think about. But storytelling is storytelling. Yeah. Not all storytelling has to be paid. Not all storytelling has to come from somebody in a suit on a big network on TV. Storytelling in all ways, even activism in our communities is about storytelling. And we can use the tools that we have today to tell different kinds of stories than the ones that are in the mainstream media. Cause I think we desperately need them. Speak and, and continuing that, I think um, the other reoccurring theme was mental health. Um, and we saw it was mental health, sorry, it was immigration. It was mental health. It was um, low income. It was like all of these put together that became um, a lot of what this book was. Now, um, and for some reason, mental health in Black people and mental health in Indigenous people is seen differently than mental health in white people and even other people of color. I'm not sure quite why, but um, maybe it has to do with us being resilient. Like they're like always a strong black people and these resilient Haitians are so resilient. And despite everything that has happened, they still have a smile on their faces and all of this. Um, but now we're seeing a lot from the communities themselves saying, hey, we have an issue. We need to talk about this. We need to talk about mental health for our children, but we also need to talk about mental health for our elders who left oftentimes um, war zones, right? And no help was given. So yes, they were brought to Canada um, and yes, they were giving housing and yes, they were, um, you know, giving these spaces, but um, how do you, do you see mental health being addressed? Because, and, and to tie that to healthcare, um, because we've seen that healthcare is also another institution where people of color um, are dying, Black women are dying, Indigenous women and, and, and people are dying, right? So how do we even tackle that? And do we have, do we even have it to tackle all of these things at once? Everything we're talking about, I think, involves a lifelong commitment to anti-racism, to anti-oppression, and I personally believe to anti-capitalist and decolonial struggle. It's bigger than just one institution, one hospital, one school board. It's bigger than all of those things. This is our history we're talking about. And I really think that people, if they don't know the work of Idel Abdullahi, who I mentioned in my book, I organized with Adil and she's one of the most brilliant and um, reputable people on this subject of black people and our mental health. I think people should really check out her work on, you know, what she calls anti-black sanism. And she, she talks about the idea that our institutions categorize black people, right? That our institutions mark black people as being a threat. Yeah. So you might just want to go to the hospital to get treatment in an emergency room and the government has been trained to look at you as, you know why that person's here? They want some hard drugs. They just want me to give them some painkillers. So they're probably not really hurt 
and I'm going to leave them to sit in the emergency room for multiple hours. When I treat them, I'm not going to take their pain seriously. And when they ask me for pain relief, I'm not probably going to give it to them the way I might to somebody else because I don't really trust their story to begin with. Um, Professor Abdullahi says that black people are treated as being like uncontainable and untreatable. So it, it is, is that we are unwanted by these systems of care and these systems of support. And we're denied any opportunities of access the way that others are. And of course, we see this in indigenous communities as well in Canada. And I think um, it is such a big thing. I talk about in the book, men like Andrew Loku, yeah. who was living in uh, mental health supportive housing when he was murdered by a police officer. Meshwar Madut, who had just found out in Winnipeg that he was going to be evicted uh, from his housing and was also like uh, seeking mental health supports at that time. Pierre Coriolan was shot and murdered in his apartment in Montreal. Same thing, was living with mental health issues, but had a community of people around him too who knew him and supported him. You know, um, we need to create circles of care for people who are left out. And um, we don't have all of the resources to be able to do that, obviously. But I think like, it starts with even like things that we might try to prevent from happening and stop doing, like stopping some of the worst harms. I was on the subway the other day and there was a person lying across several seats with a blanket, like just almost trying to sleep. And they were awoke, awoken abruptly by a stop announcement and got up and took the whole blanket with them and like walked on, wandered through the subway. And I thought, where is that person going to go this afternoon? And some people's response when they see a black person in that kind of situation is immediately to call the, the security of the TTC, to call the police, to report that individual as if, as Adil Abdullahi says, they are some kind of threat to be contained. And I think that we actually just need to stop criminalizing the notion of madness or mental health. Like that's the first place that we need to start. So many of the issues that we talk about come to reducing and taking away harmful behaviors before we can even like get to the treatment and care and support part. And um, I hear so many stories of black people who are hospitalized against their will of black people who have a health issue that has turned into a criminal justice issue. Mm -hmm. And until we agree in this country that we can't do that anymore, we can't really start talking about proper health care and proper treatment. Because if I'm gonna be denied the treatment because people are afraid of me, then there's not gonna be any treatment to be had to talk about to improve services and to improve access and care. So I really highly recommend, uh, Professor Abdullahi has a book coming out shortly called Black Woman Under State. Her, uh, dissertation work uh, at Ryerson University was about Black women accessing welfare and all of the stigmas attached to and the surveillance particularly attached to trying to get a few hundred bucks to survive and like how many hoops you have to jump through just for that little amount of sustenance that isn't even really enough to live on. So she's doing incredible work on this issue and I highly, highly recommend that people read her read her work. Hopefully, her. hopefully um, someone gets to champion her book maybe next year um, for the Red Deer Reads uh, 2022, I believe it is. It will be. Um, so I, being the, you know, Haitian woman that I am, we talk about the hard stuff. We talk about the difficult things, but we always have to, we, we like to end on a, a good note, right? Because we have to celebrate Black joy as well. We have to celebrate who we are as a people. Um, and so with all of the hard things that we've discussed, all of the difficult conversations that we've had, what brought you the most joy during this period from writing this book to now? What, what is one um, experience that stands out to you about celebrating joy and having joy, good joy? I wrote a whole chapter in this book. It's not a long chapter, but... Um kind of reflecting on this a little bit. Um, it was pretty hard writing this book. Um, what I went through writing and documenting is not comparable 
to the experiences of the actual black folks that I documented in this book. I can't try to stand in for what they have gone through. Um, but it was still really difficult for me. And there were points during the process of writing that I was like, I'm not gonna finish this. It's actually like way too much. But um, in the spring of 2017, I just write about like the things I think I would be doing if we lived in a really different world. Mm. Going for walks and being outside for hours immersed in nature, engaging in play, being with your friends and your family. Um, Alberta, for me, my strongest association, if you can believe this, with red deer and growing up there is lilacs. It is the <laughs> smell of lilac bushes in May. Yeah. And my mom used to bring lilacs in to the house, and she's been doing that for many years. And I have an association with that smell. And these are the things that I write about in the May chapter of the book because um, those were the things I was also coming back to while I was um, living through the year 2017 and all of the difficult circumstances that I, that I relate that Black people as a whole were going through. I was also trying to take time to nurture my spirit. Um, and you know something? Going on tour for the few weeks that I did in the beginning of 2020 before COVID really came and took things over, being on tour and going to different cities and having like, you know, you go to Calgary and it's like, you're in a big room and it's like half black folks and people are like, you know, it's very rare that we <laughs> have a gathering, right? That has this kind of a crowd. And it feels so good. I did an event at University of Toronto and is like 90% black folks. And I know people probably think that that happens all the time around here. It doesn't happen enough. Mm. And um, it felt so good to be sharing spaces about books and ideas with so many other black people and having people come to the mic and talk and share their stories, doing book signings with people and like getting to um, meet them for just a few moments. Um, I, I savored that so, so, so much. And then COVID came. And I had to stop doing all of those things. And all of us, our lives changed in, yeah. in, in a, bit, a different way. But it's that, it's that community. It's that being with people and being able to share something even just for a little while. It's one of the, been the, one of the most special and gratifying parts about writing this book and still being able to talk about it all this time later. Okay. Um, what optimism do you have for working with indigenous people like do what so we just talked about black joy almost celebrating joy um and we can't have that unless of course they have that as well right so how do you um how do you keep that in mind how are you um forever um knowing and reminding yourself of the solidarity that we have and we must have with indigenous people here um, in the Caribbean and even indigenous people in, in, in Africa. Because we, we tend to forget um, that those are also indigenous lands, right? And Australia as well. So what is your optimism? And if you have any, um, maybe you have a story of joy that you want to share about that aspect of as well or even um continuing to work together in solidarity these are you're asking such amazing questions like i love this so much so i want to talk about um the six nations of the grand river who are just over an hour west of where i am here uh in so-called toronto the six nations of the grand river um had their land taken by British settlers. And then the British were like, oh, you know, these Americans really want this land too. So we need to fight them. We need to go to war against them. And they asked the Six Nations of the Grand River to join them in defeating the Americans so that this territory could be preserved for the British. And the Six Nations did do that. They fought with 
the British and defeated American forces. And so the British said, as a reward, we're going to give you some of your own land back, essentially. So it's not even ours to give, but hey, you did a great job fighting with us. So we have uh, the Grand River in Ontario, which is very, very long. And they said, we're going to give you six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the source of the river to the mouth of the river. And this is a giant, giant, giant tract of land in Ontario. 95% of it has been taken away from the Six Nations of the Grand River since that time in the late 1700s, through mostly white settlers squatting on land that was not theirs and just staying there until the government was like, ah, you can have it. Um, and what remains of Six Nations territory today, uh, where many of my friends reside, is now being picked apart still. And there was a development that was proposed that the Six Nations stood up against last year. I have been going and visiting these lands and hanging out with people who are resisting, who are facing squads of Ontario Provincial Police who've surrounded their territory and never left. Dozens and dozens of arrests, beatings, people being shot by rubber bullets. All of this is happening so that a developer can come into this land and build some more houses. Now, Six Nations in Ontario has some of the worst access to drinking water in the southern part of Ontario, has some of the worst internet access, right? And yet we want to take and take and take as the federal government and as the provincial and territorial governments just continue taking. The teachings that I have received from Indigenous folks in Six Nations, the shows of love and solidarity that they have shown for us coming out to our struggles out here in Toronto, even while they're dealing with what they're dealing with. That is the hope for me for the future. We cannot fight these struggles on our own. But as Black people, we have to understand a couple of things. So one of my homies in um, Six Nations, Courtney Skye, who's a brilliant, brilliant researcher and activist, was just teaching me the other day about how the bloodlines of many Six Nations folks are mixed with Black people who came and settled up here from uh, the United States. And I'm sure many who were brought here by the French and the British to these territories as well. And that you might not look at, for example, Mohawk people today and think that they have Black ancestry, but many of them actually do. And I'm learning about my own heritage and history from this proud Mohawk woman who's out here fighting for her land and is in solidarity with Black resistance struggle too. This is the future. This is the future when we get together as Black people, as Indigenous folks, and we can never erase the linkages and the existence of Black and Indigenous tradition going back hundreds of years, people sharing both of these identities in our country this is the future, is linking our collective histories and struggles together to make a better way forward. I, I truly, truly believe that. Okay. Um, last one, last question. Um, so Alberta just had municipal, held municipal elections um, and Calgary and Edmonton both elected um, mayors of color. Um, Red Deer did not, they, we're not there yet. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we'll be there one day, hopefully. But Mike, so if you're speaking to, and when you're speaking to local government leaders, um, what would you like them to know? Because I, I get tired of hearing the equity, diversity, inclusion spiel. I get tired of hearing the multiculturalism spiel. I get tired of hearing the, you know, let's be nice to each other and let's just all get along. But if you can say something directly to one, the residents of Red Day in particular, after reading this book and seeing the struggles of people, Indigenous, Black, and others, um, and then two, to local government officials, what would you say? What would you tell Red Deer in order for Red Deer to move forward in the right way? I think it's probably just worth addressing the people who live in Red Deer rather than trying to address government officials. They have their priorities. They have their 
limitations, I'm going to say, of things that they will do and won't. And that's only going so far and we need a big change. And so what I would say to the people of Red Deer is to go back to what you said, dearly, to near the beginning about the black test. Mm -hmm. When you say that something that government should be doing is going to help black people, which black people are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about black people who already have a good job, who are visible, who have a little bit of social protection? Or are you talking about the black people who maybe just immigrated to the area recently who may not speak English as a first language, who may not have connections in the community, or the things that we're talking about actually for them. And to what extent do those people have a voice in the community to, to, to say for themselves what they want and what they need? It is not up to anybody else to do that for us. And I think that that's really critical because, you know, people think of Alberta and particularly the smaller parts of Alberta, and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you grew up there. Come to Toronto. The whole city council is white here too. Like, let's not play around that there's something weird or anomalous or backwards about Alberta that the rest of the country is not dealing with. That's not true. And I'm, I, as somebody who grew up a little bit in Alberta, I'm actually really tired of that being people's excuse. Um, anywhere we're talking about this issue, Black people exist and have to be able to articulate for themselves what they need and what they want. And we will, and we always do when, when given the opportunity. And we even do it when no opportunity is being given to us and we make one, right, for ourselves. So it's not about doing things for people or on behalf of people. It's literally about creating the space for them to tell us what they need and want and then fighting with them to carry it out. It's okay if no Black people or no people of color were elected to Red Deer City Council this time. Those are not the leaders who are gonna make the change. The people who are in the community living this every day are the ones who are gonna do it. And we should never ever forget that. I, I think that's brilliant that um, that was the last piece because I think it is local organizers, it is local residents, it's us who have to make the change and demand those changes and not just rely on local government. But I just, I can't believe the time is up um, but I just have to say a million thank yous for um, being a, a writer on behalf of so many of us, um, being a storyteller on behalf of so many of us. It's a brilliant book. I, I cry every time I read every chapter. Um, but at the same time, I'm also so incredibly proud of you that you did this and I get to um, claim you as a friend. Um, right? Like I get to say that I, I kind of met um, Desmond, but I think you're inspiring so many people across Canada and across the world, especially young Black boys. Um, so I appreciate the work, the hard work, the sweat, the tears, and um, pouring your soul into this book, into this work. And I just want to thank you for that. And also, I'm looking forward to a second book, hopefully sometime soon. Um, and no and, pressure, right? Yeah, no pressure at all. And of course, you got to come to Alberta. And the next time you're in Alberta, for sure, stop by Red Deer. We would love to have you, even if we could just go for Ethiopian coffee downtown somewhere um, and then have it at the library. I guarantee you that that's going to happen the next time I'm in town. And I would encourage people to check out and support your work, Diolita, with Ubuntu Mobilizing Central Alberta. Thank and uh, I know that you were so passionate about celebrating my work because of the work that you're doing. And so I want to say thank you to you for everything that you're doing in Red Deer and beyond. And uh, that the opportunity to continue to work together has been born through this this partnership through the library and it's i'm, I'm looking forward to it continuing ah, thank you so that means a lot to me <laughs> that's my claim to fame now <laughs> well and um i'm i'm pretty happy that we were able to create that space where we could have that incredible conversation uh, we we had lots of great comments on the Facebook page, and like one of the last one uh, says that both of you are an inspiration to many. So I want you to know that, and I also want Desmond to know that actually uh, Diluta, Sadia, and myself we met and we we discussed the possibility of creating some uh, meeting space at the library for um, youth groups. 
that Ubuntu supports in the community. And hopefully when we are back to in-person programming, that will happen. And um, I, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the library, of our readers who were reading the book, um, who chose the book to be our uh, Radio Read 2021. And um, yeah, so let's hope that one day we would be able to meet in person and maybe you'll come to a meeting which would be full of black folks in the library and we'll have a, a joyful and, and great another conversation and that would bring us a little bit closer to, to a better place and better community. Thank you so much. Have a great evening and um, well, we'll see each other, right? Yeah. Hopefully soon. Thanks so much, Desmond. And thank you again, Tatiana. Thank you, bye Tatiana, bye. so much for all your work. Thank you, Red Deer Public Library. Thank you so much.